name is Frank Smith. I'm with Pipe Tech, and we're talking about critical surge solutions when in, in referring to uh, reuse water applications. Um, most of our reuse water applications will be coming from a sewage treatment plant where we're taking the water and sending it off into different uh, facets. Um, we have several different examples. We're going to start off with the City of Dallas reuse water system go into the city of Fort Worth and then also Los Angeles, describing the computer analysis, the application, the design of a reuse water pump station. So we start off with getting the water out of the sewage treatment plant uh, in the pump station itself. The picture that we have here shows a, a surge vessel at a pump station, and this is to uh, give and receive energy, be it on a pump trip or uh, events happening in the field. So we're going to look at primarily what happens at the pump station itself um, with pump trips and normal operation and then we'll look into the field with regard to the different types of control valves that might be in the field where we're taking water and how that can affect the overall system. Because you have multiple customers pulling off of your reuse water system we look at monitoring the pump station itself so that if we have a new customer, say, uh, has a eight inch control valve, they decide to put in a pneumatic valve that'll close in a couple seconds time. When that valve closes, we're gonna have an upsurge high pressure wave oscillate back to our pump station. With our transient monitoring computer, we'll pick up those disturbances in the piping system so that we can evaluate it in the field and make those corrections. Um, the, the damaging part to the system overall would be the operation of the customers you're selling your reuse water to. Uh, many of these customers that you have, they're pulling large sources of water. One of the biggest uses that you'll see in this model is golf courses. Uh, in one case, we're, we're pulling uh, wo reuse water into um, a pond and filling the pond. We have a control valve, and that control valve is opening and closing at a certain time step so that we don't create a change in velocity abrupt that'll send a shockwave back into our system. And it's also distributing the water equally to all of our customers. So the same control valve will sustain a back pressure in the system so that everybody has a minimum amount of water in the system. Typically we see that at least 30 PSI back pressure in the system. But again, we look at that from a computer modeling standpoint of balancing out the system. So the most important part of a reuse water system is the computer analysis and looking at the operation of the system. So there's an example of the surge vessel. In the bottom uh, left-hand corner, you'll see the transient monitoring computer. And then in this, it'll record the data. We look at this once a year to make sure the normal operation of the system. It records day-to-day -day operation of the pumps, be the pressure in a given time step. It, as I said, will also record transients that occur and that if a transient does occur coming from another source, as I said, like a control valve, it'll read that transient, it'll record it, and it'll send off an alarm back into the SCADA system so that the operators know we've had an upset into our piping system. So here's a model I've already run this in a steady state condition. Um, this would be the pump station itself. And I'll zoom in on that so you have a better feel for what's going on. We have in the model itself, you have one pump drawn in the model. But if you look in the, the pump data, we're actually running two of the exact same pump uh, in parallel. Uh, there, in this case, we have actually four pumps. So we can add multiple pumps by just changing with the click of our mouse, adding a, a third pump or a fourth pump or one pump. And we can look at the overall design of the system. Uh, in this case, in maintaining the pressure in the system, these are variable speed drive pumps so that they'll operate within a broad range to supply reuse water to the customer. Um, as I said, we also have a surge vessel here. And for the point of this demonstration, I'm going to go ahead and turn that off. Zoom in all. So a little bit of detail about the model itself. This is our first customer. This again is the golf course and we're filling into a pond. Uh, at that particular node, our pressure is 52.5 PSI. We have a sustaining back pressure valve. 
so that we sustain a back pressure in the system as this valve opens up so that we don't draw the water out of the system. And as you can see, there's a huge elevation change. We could easily drain out this whole pipeline as we're filling um, the, the pond itself. So we need to sustain a back pressure in the system. My next customer would be Stevens Park. And in this case, we're filling a, a reservoir and our flow rate and again, I've run this in steady state. We can click on the line there. We're flowing to Stevens Park at 2,317 uh, gallons per minute. And to Crestview is 2,500 gallons per minute. So you have two customers in the model itself. And hopefully as this uh, reuse water system expands, we'll have multiple customers and again, that will be the, the living model as it is. As more customers come online, we can add additional lines, control valves, and look at the cause and effect of the system and how our pumps back at the pump station here are operating and what our flow is going to be. So I'm going to rerun the model with the surge vessel off just so you can see the cause and effect in the piping system. So we're running the pumps, and you can see a pump trip where the flow velocity, we were pumping at 5,000 gallons per minute. We had a pump trip. The negative wave traveled down the piping system, basically at 3,280 feet per second. That wave then oscillated back as a high pressure wave, as you can see in the pressure graph, uh, and exceeded our discharge pressure that we were at. And that wave's going to oscillate back and forth before the friction loss of the piping dissipates the energy in the pressure wave. And we'll run this out for 500 seconds. So you see it's very gradually uh, cushioned itself. Uh, we're operating about 110 PSI and flowing 5,000 gallons per minute. We turned off the pump and we went to full cavitation, minus 14.7, which at that point our reuse water is not existing as a liquid. It's going to a gas. When that gas bubble collapses, we have a high pressure wave oscillating back at 165 PSI. Um, the high pressure is within the pressure rating of the pipe. The issue in this case is that the pipe is not rated for vacuum condition. So we need to minimize the pressure from occurring, uh, dropping below atmospheric pressure. Uh, in this case, we need to give energy to that change in velocity, and that's where the surge vessel came into play. Now, under normal operating conditions, as we start and stop the pump, we have the, the vertical turbine pumps, we have pump control valves, and we have these pumps on variable speed drive. So we can gradually ramp up the pump and the control valve to get flow into the system maintain our set flow rate based on demand, and then when we're ready to shut off the pump, we can go from, be it 80% or 100% of the motor speed, ramp it back down to say 30 hertz, and then turn off the pump as we manipulate the pump control valve to minimize the shock in the system. When we model a reuse water system though, we're looking for the worst case scenario, which would be a power failure. So in this case, we've simulated a power failure. We obviously have a problem with the negative pressure waves, and now we'll create a solution to the problem. So I'm going to put the surge vessel in service. It's a very large tank at 2,013 cubic feet. has a pre-charge pressure of 55 PSI. I'm going to go back and model the system. and we can look at the cause and effect. Now, we turned off the pump, but that pre-charge pressure of 50 PSI, 55 PSI, plus the pump operating pressure of 110 PSI, means the pre-charge in that bladder was 110 PSI. So if we look at a pressure gauge on the surge vessel, that gauge is reading 150, 110 PSI. When we turned off the pump, the pump is going to ramp down. We look at the inertia of that pump, but then we have that stored energy of 110 PSI in that volume, 
which is pushing out water from the surge tank and falling in behind that negative wave as it leaves the pump station. Again, our objective is to keep the line positive at all times. This was with the surge vessel and without. You can see how nice, smooth balance system. We're not putting a lot of stress on our piping system. So this is a computer surge analysis for reuse water system, supplying cooling water for um, Los Angeles Power and Water. Um, we have the ability in, in the model, we have four pumps running, um, pulling out of a, a reservoir, and I have a surge vessel that I have in the system. I've run the model prior to this, and this gives you an overview of the model itself and data. And the issue is when we have a pump trip, we'll zoom in on that data. We were operating at 138 PSI pump trip. The pressure goes to cavitation, and then high pressure isn't an issue, but the low pressure is an issue. Uh, and looking at a solution as we're supplying water to the power plant. So we've gone into the model. And again, you think to yourself, you look at the model, and you see all those air vacuum valves. How could we go to a vacuum condition with all those valves in play? So here's an air vacuum valve, which is typically found in a reuse water application to allow uh, air out of the piping system as a pressure air relief valve, but under a vacuum condition and down surge like we're experiencing here is to open up and break the vacuum to keep the line at atmospheric pressure. So there is my device. My device data, I have an input data that the air vacuum valve will open up in one-tenth of a second. Uh, typically in a wastewater application, our default is one second. With our transient monitoring computer, we've evaluated several air vacuum valves in the field and find out that the opening time is between, you know, three tenths of a second to one second time. Now you think, wow, that's, uh, that's pretty quick when it comes to, you know, a valve opening in this air vacuum valve. Um, prior to 2006, we'd build a computer model which assumed that this air vacuum valve would open up instantaneously. So the modeling data would always show, you know, the valve would open up and everything would be fine in the model. In reality, when we put in our transient monitoring computer, we were seeing these negative pressures occurring in the system. So the, the issue was it took a fraction of a second for the air vacuum valve to open up. The, the valve is an active valve, whereas the reuse water um, pressurizes and seals off the float mechanism. So you have to get the water out of the air vacuum valve. You have to break the seal that's closing off the valve to allow then atmospheric air to drop in behind that negative wave as that negative wave is traveling down the piping system. But remember, this negative wave is traveling at 3,280 feet, 4,000 feet per second for, say, ductile iron pipe. So it has to act, and when it doesn't act fast enough, um, you see that in the model. So grabbing that air valve, we can expand the data and see that in this case, at that particular node, it, it may or may not have opened. We can actually go into and look at the volume of air. And you see that valve then open up even under the worst case scenario of a pump trip. So that would be, a, I would say, a bad example. So let's go back into the model, grab our reservoir, zoom all, grab the end of the line, and let's see in the computer model where our problem might exist. Okay, so we can pretty much pick any node. Um, this is the lay of the land, and you can see when we ran the model from our pressure envelope, we don't over exceed the pressure until we get to the end of the line but we're in a vacuum condition under most of this piping system. What's also neat about the software is that we can simulate in animation this shock wave. 
Baker goes the negative way down the line, below atmospheric pressure. At those points, you see the air vacuum valves trying to break uh, and allow air to come into the system. So now we can get a better feel for the line. And let's say we'll grab this particular air vacuum valve and look at the cause and effect in our piping system at that point. So this, and again in the software, at that time step shows the how many cubic feet of air is allowed into the piping system to try to break that vacuum condition. And then if we go to the pressure, we can see we're still dropping with that air vacuum valve in service, we're still dropping um, to rate of cavitation. So, and again, so we have a problem even with all the air vacuum valves in there. And again, from a modeling standpoint, usually we make the assumption that are the valves working or not. We have several municipalities that have put air vacuum valves in the system for 30 years, and they want to know if they're working or not. So one of the great things about transient monitoring data is that when we do the initial startup and commissioning of a system, we have a data file showing that pressure envelope under normal operating conditions. Then we can come back a year later or two years later and let's just say like in this scenario we have several miles of pipe. I don't know if those air vacuum valves are working. We hook up to our computer again. We do the same test and look at the pressure uh, graph that's generated to see if those air valves are working or not. Uh, in this case our solution was going back to the pump station in installing a surge vessel to give energy to protect our reuse water pumps in pipeline. So I'm going back in the model, I'm going to turn this on, and let's look at the cause and effect of giving energy to that change in velocity. We see by giving energy with the surge vessel, it's a nice smooth transition that we remain positive through the whole line. And then if we group the model together, we can see that we'll never uh, drop below atmospheric pressure. So here's an overview of the model. You see it's positive. A couple areas, again, right in here before we were going into cavitation. It looks like we're right at atmospheric pressure in through here. And then we do have an issue along this portion of the line. So what we need to do is go back into the model and see what's happening at the end of the pipeline. See that particular node. So in this case, we're dropping to minus three PSI. And at this point, you look at what the, the pressure rating, negative pressure rating of the pipe. Again, our rule of thumb, Dr. Lyron pipe, we can accept up to a minus 6 PSI, never below minus 6 PSI. PVC pipe, minus 2 PSI. So at this point, you look at a lot more stress in the piping system, vacuum condition, and the further evaluation of your air vacuum valve. So let's, again, take a step back and look at what's happening with this air vacuum valve. And in the model, we can see it's opening up. It's allowing a certain volume, short volume of air into the piping system. From the owner's standpoint in evaluating this line is to make sure these air vacuum valves are working, functioning. In this case, we're actually going through a testing procedure to see under different conditions how fast the valve is opening and closing. Um, the size, the uh, looking at the design of the float, uh, the sealing mechanisms to see how quickly the valve will open up as that vacuum condition occurs. Um, there are several cases where we put in a pressure vacuum breaker style um, vacuum breaker so that if our pressure is normally, let's just say five PSI or greater, then the valve is closed. As soon as we drop below, say five PSI, the valve cracks open, starts to open. 
it might start to leak, but under normal conditions, it would only open under a transient wave scenario, allowing air to break in and keeping the line at atmospheric pressure. So a lot goes into thinking about the specific valve that you might put in the application and how it would work from a transient standpoint. Uh, and also, in many cases, if we have a lot of air entering into the piping system and a reuse water, then we're concerned with that as that negative wave goes out and we allow air to enter into the piping system, then when that high pressure wave oscillates back, we have all this air exiting the piping system. In our computer modeling data, we can model this as a three-stage air vacuum valve. So we can control the air coming out of the air vacuum valve so we don't have a secondary transient wave um, if the valve slams shut. Can you imagine if this was a six inch air vacuum valve and it bam slams shut in a, a second's time? That would then send out another shock wave into the system. So in, in, in this case, we have a surge check that will close and we're relying on a smaller orifice. So we're cushioning that air as it's traveling out of the piping system. Then when the, the water reaches the, to the top, it seals off the mechanism so that we don't discharge uh, our reuse water uh, to atmosphere. And then that'll open up if uh, air accumulates in the line as a pressure air relief valve. We want a pressure air relief valve in our system because as air accumulates in the line, it's going to back our pump on the curve and affect the efficiency of our overall piping system. When we look at our reuse piping system and air in the line, and if we create a transient wave, like we showed in the model, we've modeled everything perfect, okay? We see, uh, uh, in this case, a scenario towards the end of the line. But if I had a pipeline that is full of air and a high point and not a pressure relief valve, what happens to this negative wave as it travels down our piping system? Well, we saw, we saw the problem at the pump station with the surge vessel. So we've created this shock wave, and we know at a certain point we're going to get to a minus two PSI. But what if that line is partially full of air? What happens to the shock wave? Well, under a, a smaller diameter pipe, we're gonna increase the velocity. As we increase the velocity traveling through that piping air pocket, we increase the velocity, we're gonna reduce our pressure. So at that point, we could re increase our velocity to the point where I'm going to a dangerous vacuum condition and end up destroying the pipe. What does that look like? An example of the negative pressure wave as it comes into the piping system, draws into the pipe, and then reflects back as a high pressure wave. You'll see on the left hand side, the pipe, this is a 16 inch PVC pipe that was subjected to pressure vacuum, pressure vacuum until it failed. The failure is a nice long rip along the piping system. The other picture to the right is a reuse water system in Texas. And you can see how the piping is pressure vacuum, pressure vacuum, and then completely shredded. Again, this would be your worst case scenario. The cost of evaluating and looking at the problem, in this case, it, this problem could exist in the model I just showed you, and a lot of care and guidance has to go to how that air vacuum valve is functioning at the end of the line. It's also, we look at the control valves in the system. This would be a large control valve that we're evaluating its opening and closing time. In your reuse water system, you'll have a control valve filling, be it a pond, a reservoir, or a ground storage tank, where we're maintaining a back pressure in the system as we're supplying water. If this valve reacts too quickly, it'll also send a shock wave into the system. So here's our computer modeling data, and we're looking at running the pump, and what happens when this valve in the model closes. So our input data in closing this control valve in our reuse water system is that our customer in this case put in a pneumatic valve that's gonna close in two seconds. And we wanna know the cause and effect of the shock wave and how it affects our system. So I'm gonna run the model. And you see when that valve closes, it sends out a upsurge, as you see, We've exceeded 400 feet of head, and let's take a closer look at that. If within our system, 
We are operating at 65 PSI pressure. That valve closed and we end up with 160 PSI shock wave occurring when that valve closed. So this would be a bad scenario. At our reuse water pump station, we can follow this wave back to the pump station as that wave travels throughout the whole entire piping. And if we had our transient monitoring computer here at the pump station, let's see what that would record. So normally we'd be looking at, we're running the pumps, all should be well, but this is what we would have recorded. We're pumping 80 PSI out of our plant. All of a sudden, bam, we get hit by a shock wave, 120 PSI, what happened? We have a reuse water customer that their valve is closing too quickly. So you can go out and try to search when this happened, who was using water at that time and find that valve. So in reality, we find the valve, zoom all, go back to this valve and say, you are sized incorrectly. We want you to close in 60 seconds. And I'll regroup the model. So here's the pressure difference between that customer out in the field. And again, as you're supplying reuse water, you're, you're, you might not be in control of this customer's selection of the valve, but in evaluating your whole system by having your plans and spec calling out your valve will close in this time step, 60 seconds, you have a well-maintained system. So you can see how modeling helps evaluate, understand your system, look at the worst case scenario, be it you know, your air valves in the field or how your control valves are set to the design of the reuse pump station itself, being that you need to put a surge vessel to give and receive energy to your starting and stopping of the pumps and pump control valves, which we'll be discussing later in designing building a water booster station.